as in the past, the consequences of climate change will strongly influence where we can live, how we can grow food and feed our families, and what water we can drink, what resources we can use, and many other non-traditional security challenges. Non-traditional security challenges are risks to the survival and well-being of people that arise out of non-military sources. These challenges are national risks for Pakistan, but they are often transnational in nature. Formulating national and international answers, answers to such risks is absolutely necessary for sustainable political development. And in Pakistan, rising temperatures are leading to the melting of its many glaciers, as well as further burdening the fewer resources to its growing population. Moreover, climate change leads to a degradation of ecosystems. It impacts biodiversity and it causes desertification and flooding in Pakistan, which then in turn can cause numerous serious problems such as mass migration, starvation or poverty. Pakistan is highly vulnerable to climate change and that's why roundtable like the one today becomes so important for us. Our role at roundtables is to seek a comprehensive response to climate change, to help Pakistan in reducing its greenhouse gas emissions by bringing science to policymakers, and finally, to support global partnerships in the defense against climate change. Today, we will explore, discuss, and analyze the issue, and also start preparing possible policy options for a climate change conference with CGSS later. Ladies and gentlemen, in only three days, we will celebrate the International World Environment Day hosted by Pakistan. And probably the best way to prepare this is by raising awareness about climate change, what it means for us and how to best mitigate its negative consequences. So I'm very much looking forward to today's discussion by our panel experts. Thank you all once again for participating. Thank, thank you, Dr. Stephen Kodela, for your very important remarks. And I think this uh, a seminar, uh, this webinar, more precisely, it is also very important because most of the activities which government is taking at this point of the time, those are related to the mitigation. I think the debate on climate change and the national security threat, it will also urge something about the adaptation which is directly needed thing in the Pakistan, in the context of the Pakistan. Thank you so much, Dr. Stephen, for highlighting this very important issue. Before that, I start uh, inviting our guest for today webinar. I just want to show you, you know, one slide of my presentation. Let if you can upload it. So on this context, I did a study with UNDP Pakistan and National Defense University, climate change as a national security threat. So we can find number of studies which conceptual framework are with different frameworks across the world. So which are and also from the Pakistan, but they talk about climate change in climate change and national security. But this is the only study which I did with the UNDP and, and the National Defense University that was done on the ground level. So we collected data. If you can show the next slide. So this is no, no, go back. Go back, yes, this one. UNDP one. Proper. This one. So when we this uh, this study we conducted, no, no, this one, up one, only this picture. Only up. Go up. Yes, this one. So this is the only study which we did on field data. We did field work in the four provinces of Pakistan. We collected data from there and we talk and we spoke to common men from agriculture field, from the fruit archers, from the coastal area, especially from Badin. So they were interfacing the problem of sea intrusion and other things. So on the basis of, we find some interesting uh, uh, findings, which I will share in the, in the last part of this webinar. But right now, I would like to invite our honorable guest, Dr. Rashid Aftab. He is a director of the Rifa Institute of Public Policy, Rifa International University. Dr. Rashid, are you here? Can you hear me? 
Uh, please, thank you. Uh, can I proceed? G, uh, can you? Dr. Akashi, sorry, G. I have to make one more announcement. Every speaker, they have five to seven minutes to give the initial remarks. For a discussion, we have second, we will have the second round. So I will request, okay, please keep your marks up to five to seven minutes. If you cross the limit of the seven minutes, then I have to stop you. But at the five minutes, I will give a question to you so that your time is going to end. Thank you so much for all uh, all participants. No, Dr. Rasha, the floor is yours. Oh, th uh, thank you very much. Uh, can you listen me? Is it okay? Yes, yes, we can listen to you very well. Okay, thank you very much. A, a very good afternoon to all of you. And uh, it's a great privilege. And uh, I really appreciate uh, CGSS for uh, arranging in a very uh, it's a webinar on a very pertinent topic, uh, which is very much critical uh, and uh, much related with our national security. Uh, and uh, I may proceed with my deliberations. Uh, and I think uh, Dr. Stephen has rightly indicated about the correlation between the environment and the climate change and, uh, and the risk associated with in context with Pakistan. Uh, I believe that uh, Pakistan is already on the list of uh, the 10th nations most affected by climate change in spite of its negligible contribution to greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the country's climate becoming increasingly uncertain, resulting in frequent and devastating flooding in some regions and droughts in the others. Glacier melts and more importantly, temperature higher than the global average. These trends are likely to continue in future with parts of the country experiencing extreme weather condition. Just uh, take an example that uh, uh, Pakistan, uh, what I was going through the uh, precipitation data and uh, uh, what I saw that Pakistan received much uh, less rainfall in January 2021 as compared to the previous year. Make it uh, the 17th uh, driest month in 60 years. Uh, the variable of water is an integral part of climate change and its security is critical and may be regarded as non-traditional security challenge. And there can be a several causes to water scarcity, including rainfall, uh, high population density, over allocation of water resources, and above all, the climate change. In context with the water security, the climate change will make matters worse in the no in number of ways. Uh, I believe first, the total quantity of water is likely to decline, thus increasing the scarcity of uh, level. Secondly, the water availability will become more erratic, thus increasing uncertainty and seasonal stresses and strains. Thirdly, the increased temperature will reduce water availability further because higher evaporation rates while increasing crop water requirements and other water demands. Uh, what we have seen that Pakistan has already experienced severe drought in its southern region, especially in Tharparkar in Sindh province in 1998 to 2002 and uh, subsequently in 2014 and to, uh, 2017. It uh, makes uh, likely to intensify because of the climate change, which threatens the situation in a number of ways. Firstly, if glacier continues to decline, the contribution of snow and glacier melt will ultimately decrease. Secondly, climate change will also affect the monsoon pattern. And thirdly, the higher temperature throughout the country will increase water demand as well as evaporation. All three factors are likely to contribute to an increased frequency of droughts. As uh, the in, Since we already know uh, that uh, the Indus Basin system is fed up uh, by glaciers, from the three interconnected mountain ranges, like Himalayas, the Karakuram, and Hindu Kush. Uh, of the three, uh, which means HKH region, the glaciers in the Himalayas and Hindu Kush are melting, similar to those in the rest of the world. However, 
the curriculum however appears to be behaving in an inconsistent manner for example some glaciers are stable others are melting some even appears to be increasing thus no one expect glaciers to remain stable when the temperature rises the country is sensitive to both increase in the temperature and change it, changes in the precipitation these could increase vulnerabilities for agriculture forest and water sources upon which depends the largest part of economy and livelihood increase in the temperature due to climate change could particularly alter biophysical relationship for crops or livestock fisheries and forest such as short shortening of the growing periods changing the species uh, patterns increasing the thermal and moisture stresses changing water requirements altering soil characteristics and increasing the risk of pests and diseases the effect of climate change on agriculture which is uh, and uh, about i think uh, more than 94% of water is consumed by the agriculture uh, uh, and other natural resources may vary across the diverse agro ecological regions in the dry western mountain mountainous areas the increase in the temperature could enhance the process of de glacial uh, de glacial uh, uh, glacialization by affecting our water resources on which country depends for agriculture and energy production these mountainous areas are already mm -hmm. under pressure the, please conclude uh, uh, due to various natural Uh, activities uh, consequently there is an ongoing process of environmental degradations lastly i must link the climate change with the disasters because the increasing frequency of climate uh, variability extreme event uh, is a major concern for pakistan the sad, sad part of the story is that we are not doing much adopt to climate change which makes us more vulnerable to its adverse impact that may threaten the country's food and water security uh, the the principal question arises does pakistan's development policy take climate change into account uh, and this is the uh, I, i think uh, this is the this is the area which we have to think of all together i think although some measures have been taken but we do not see much seriousness on the part of the policy makers to take more actions to mitigate the negative effect of climate change the government must develop a comprehensive framework linking the mitigation efforts to its industrial agriculture and energy related and other policies to enforce uh, to reverse the impact of the fast changing climate conditions for this uh, the nexus approach of water food energy is uh, in context with the climate change is prerequisite thank you very much Thank you, Dr. Rashid, for uh, adhering to the time, and I uh, expect our, from all the extreme panelists the same, because I see so many famous faces on climate change, like uh, Ali Tokeshi and uh, Kamar and number of other friends who are here. So, uh, next speaker is for our discussion is Dr. Yusuf Zafar. He is a one well-known personality on if we talk about the climate change in Pakistan. Oh, sorry, by agriculture in the Pakistan. he served the nation for many years in different capacity and he is still serving the nation sir floor is yours sir up to mic and mute kar le we cannot hear you good afternoon <laughs> thank you cgss and maine kar liya sir mute unmute kar liya hai can you sir we can hear you we can hear you now can you listen me or not i cannot yes, hear sir. you we can hear you please go ahead yes uh, uh my task was to do something uh, with the climate change and agriculture and uh, 
as we know in pakistan the the energy consumption is so low so we are not you know among the top producer of greenhouse gases we are not contributing to that and whatever in pakistan is contributing to the uh, climate change but to call is uh, 51% is energy uh, is the uh, in energy sector and the second one is agriculture 39% because our productivity is low therefore uh, these things are very serious and moreover with the uh, you know uh, our research base as the climate change is impacting so we have to develop uh, you know uh, our strategy for climate smart agriculture which is uh, you know in all respects i will not discuss in detail but it is with the new seed with more resilience to drought with flooding with disease because the new disease is emerging due to climate change and you know the timing the crop diversity so this all come under climate smart agriculture but unfortunately the government of pakistan although they are working on uh, agriculture transformation plan in order to feed the uh, but they are not directly taking up these uh, you know research agenda the basic emphasis on all the agriculture transformation plan which government has announced earlier under the uh, agriculture emergency program and now agriculture transformation plan which is very soon coming in the new budget is a 100 billion rupees program but it is all dealing with subsidies with billion you know rupees semen for having more milk in the livestock so i want to raise the issue in this discussion that if we want national food security so these you know simple isolated actions will not resolve the issue of food security we are already facing the problems that this this financial year we have imported you know food items save around 1.75 billion dollar worth of uh, wheat which is after 12 years that we have imported wheat about 650 million dollar worth of sugarcane about you know 2 billion dollar worth of uh, cotton and then 1.2 billion dollar worth of pulses so it's a very alarming that the our food bill import is increasing and our productivity due to many reasons is not increasing in the country and the actions which government is taking in isolated actions our climate change you know policies are mostly linked with the billion tree program only there is a lot of emphasis this is a very good, good you know initiative but that is not alone enough so and moreover with the new you know government plan to privatize the research you know that will definitely disturb not only disturb but hurt the you know the minimal agriculture research base which already exists in the country there is a lot of uh, uh, you know uh, earlier attempt was made during uh, you know musharraf era to privatize the public sector research but that was not successful now it is coming under a new name that we want to make the corporate rise the four major crop research institution and we will make center of excellence and then the private sector will run those centers although the employees will be from the government sector but i think that uh, uh, whatever system we have developed over 72 years uh, that will you know will ruin the uh, public sector research base in the country so under the scenario of climate change it is more important to have a climate smart agriculture and more modern research in order to cope with the challenging issues of water scarcity or flooding 
uh, world uh, new pest attacks uh, like last year we have a rust attack and it doomed the uh, wheat crop similarly so we need you know more research base uh, to cope with the you modern challenges and therefore therefore i will request that uh, uh, you know the government should uh, revisit the whole plan of agri transformation under the climate change scenario thank you thank you dr yusuf zafar and uh, it was nice to listen to you again you spoke for 7 minutes but you tried to cover up the 7 decades thank you sir now so our next speaker is dr mohammad irfan khan he is a dean of faculty of basic and applied sciences international islamic university islamabad that is one of his introduction but he has to work very closely with the civil society on the issue of climate change dr irfan floor is yours Dr. Fan, can you hear me? I think Dr. Fan is uh, not present here. So I will now request our another esteemed uh, panelist, Dr. Shaheen uh, Akhtar. She is a professor at the Department of International Relations, National Defence University, Islamabad. Ma'am, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Shaheen. Uh, uh, Shakil, and it's a great opportunity to be part of this conversation, uh, which is very important. Uh, I think uh, the impact of climate change has already been uh, highlighted as a, uh, the uh, focus of uh, this uh, um, roundtable is more more on looking at uh, climate change as a non-traditional security threat. So first, I mean, looking at a bit of uh, the linkage between the uh, two, how climate change and uh, national security are interlinked, and there has not been much understanding or awareness about that for us uh, 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 until very recently. But what we are now see is that uh, at least uh, there has been some recognition of uh, the climate change as a, a emerging threat to national security, and uh, which goes with the broadening of the definition of the security uh, 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 itself. Uh, the uh, uh, the various uh, uh, theorists in the field have been so far linking the uh, uh, resource scarcity, natural resource scarcity, with the conflict, so like uh, Homer Dixon, uh, Robert Kaplan, and uh, Barry Buzan, in fact, uh, brought it into the discourse uh, uh, of international relations and national security. So it is important to flag that uh, how this habit. Uh, uh, um, uh, say concept uh, and uh, the threat, uh, uh, which was very much a uh, part of uh, the uh, say national security uh, domain, is now getting some uh, uh, recognition by the policymakers because it was affecting the community. But it was like uh, uh, more uh, state-centric approaches which have been dominating, which are looking at the security of the state only, not uh, people-centric. Now this people security has been like uh, very much integrated into that in terms of being referent, in terms of being the, the scope and nature of the threat that it is posing, and in terms of uh, the approach to deal with it. Uh, so like uh, the uh, all the strategy that we are talking about, whether it's adaptation, whether it is mitigation, or whether it is creating awareness. Uh, so they are all important. And I'll just uh, uh, flag uh, the... Uh, uh, two uh, reports which have come out very recently. One is uh, like uh, uh, the uh, uh, the ADB, uh, ADB Asian Development Bank and World Bank report, which has come very recently, which talked about Pakistan facing increases in uh, average temperatures, uh, which is going to be above global level uh, average. Uh, the, uh, previously, it was like. Uh, uh, more in line with the global average, which was 0.6 percent. So this is this means uh, that uh, Pakistan is going to be hard hit uh, by the extreme event. So that is the area which why I want to really focus and develop on. Uh, so the rising temperature is going to actually uh, uh, say instigate uh, the uh, irregular rainfall patterns and uh, uh, floods and. Uh, and uh, which is actually uh, um, because there will be erratic uh, monsoon and uh, change of precipitation uh, levels. So Pakistan will be like facing extreme events, uh, which is going to undermine its water security, its energy security, and food security, which are interlinked. And that's another nexus which is being lately realized that 
uh, that uh, sectoral approaches are not going to work. This has to be cross-sectoral approaches. Uh, uh, glacier melt has been actually mentioned. Uh, there was a very interesting, uh, uh, um, say, um, information that I came across in the report was that uh, normally we believe that this uh, there is a cro crocrum anomaly. Now we dis uh, say see that in 2018. Uh, this crocrum anomaly, which was like more of a maybe glacier advancing or uh, more stable, is no more. So the indication are that uh, uh, they are also equally unstable, uh, with the result that there will be more flash floods um, in the northern region of Pakistan. So we are also like um, uh, in two, like uh, facing the uh, um, uh, the problem of uh, retreating uh, Himalayan glaciers. Um, very important uh, glaciers that are under stress like uh, Kolahai, Siachen Glacier, uh, I think which are very important in terms of their contribution to the Indus River system that Pakistan is dependent on because Pakistan is a single basin country are uh, under a lot of stress. So uh, it is like going to really create a lot of uh, say uh, pressure on Pakistan. So what we uh, 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 and what we see is that Pakistan is gradually moving upward in the uh, say say uh, ranking of uh, countries which are now under greater risk. So we were like at uh, ranked uh, eight and ten, and now we are ranked fifth. So that means our exposure to the extreme events is increasing in terms of floods, in terms of droughts, in terms of the heat waves which is uh, also interacting uh, with our social vulnerabilities uh, uh, in uh, say various regions of Pakistan. Uh, and there is a rising population as well. So if you really uh, look at uh, the, uh, uh, is, uh, uh, and correlate it with the existing uh, uh, social vulnerabilities, uh, then you see that it becomes uh, very, uh, say, uh, challenging for Pakistan because in the end, what is like disaster? It is like uh, uh, your exposure to a hazard and your lack of preparedness, preparedness to respond to that. So if, you, if there's no preparedness or adequate pre preparedness, then obviously you are be, will be more exposed and more uh, actually uh, vulnerable. So what is happening is at the moment, uh, we are moving away from a paradigm of the disaster management, which is good enough, but uh, not sufficient uh, to disaster risk, risk reduction. And I'm just trying to look at the disaster risk reduction framework, uh, which has been uh, you now, uh, say, uh, 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 if you give me one minute, please, uh, is the Sankai framework, which gives a uh, four priority. Uh, priority one is understanding the disaster risk. Second is disaster risk reduction governance uh, uh, to manage disaster risk. The third is investing in disaster risk uh, reduction resilience. And the uh, fourth one is enhancing disaster uh, preparedness for effective response to build uh, back better uh, in recovery, rehabilitation, and reconstruction. What I want to conclude my based on that is Pakistan, this governance institution framework is actually evolving. But there are a lot of areas that Pakistan has to actually focus on in terms of uh, participation of the stakeholder, uh, especially when it comes to the CBOs and the com community. Understanding of the risk, uh, 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 disaster risk is also quite poor because the data and information which is required is one, not complete. Uh, for, uh, the baseline data, the other access to data is also not really. Just a couple of lines, uh, Shakil, if you allow me, uh, uh, which which requires more effort actually to really develop a comprehensive disaster risk reduction plan uh, with the participation of all stakeholders. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. I hope you can understand me. Being a moderator, it's my job to keep the time in the sequence and so we can finish at the everybody have the equal time. So now I would like to request uh, Dr. Arfan, Muhammad Arfan Khan. He is a dean, faculty of basic and applied sciences, International Islamic University, as I mentioned already. He also working very closely with the civil society and he is assisting civil society to learn the different issues of environment. Dr. Arfan, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Shakil. I'm audible. 
Yes, you are audible. Yes, sir. Okay. Oh, okay, thank you very much. First of all, thanks to the CGSS for organizing this event and inviting me on this very important topic about the climate change as a non-traditional security threat, particularly with reference to Pakistan. And what I'm going to give my stance over here, give it a national security perspective in terms of uh, the water, food, and energy together, known as the environmental security. So the environmental security and the national security for me is the one and the same thing. Climate change and environmental degradation, whether local or at international level, uh, they pose threats uh, to ecosystem services, human well-being, development, and ultimately to national security. If environmental security in terms of water, food, and energy security is considered as a national security or with this perspective, for me, the nexus of water, food, and energy, like Dr. Shaheen explained with here, that builds an intrinsic link between environmental security and national security. Right now, this complex relationship of environmental security with human and national security is reshaping the contemporary political discourse as emerging environmental challenges such as climate change, which is not only threatening the development process because they're talking about climate compatible development, but also national security by risking our environmental security. So the resulting discourse is to translate environmental security concerns into national security practices and broaden the horizon of national security agenda. Our national security agenda that should be, I think that should include the environmental security along with the traditional security. The importance of structural or traditional security is not going to be undermined, but my argument is that it must be broadened to include the environmental security in that. So the environmental security issues have impacted livelihood, human security, social equity, human rights, internal security, political stability, economic growth and development and so forth within the state and interstate and intrastate. And there are a lot of studies around we find in the literature. But the nexus of climate change and environmental security in terms of water, food and energy must be considered in relation to conflict and development also because there's creating conflicts. And then environmental challenges like mm, the present one, the climate change, in relation to water scarcity, food shortages, and energy deficit. They must be considered that they are related to human consumption and they are reshaping our consumption pattern also, which are directly linked with our climate compatible development also. And which may probably cause an intra and interstate conflict, not only in the country, in the region, even in South Asia, we have energy and water conflicts already there. So now environmental security concerns have also broadened the foreign policy agenda and discourse of international relations to include environmental diplomacy to a certain environmental security challenges because the global environmental politics has also an emerging agenda with international relations. So I conclude it here that there is a need for environmental diplomacy within Pakistan, between the provinces, among the provinces, and within the region, among the members of the South country particularly, as well as in the region, to integrate the development with environmental security and peace, which are an imperative for achieving sustainable development goal, not only for any state in South Asia, but as a whole, the South Asian region. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Fan, and uh, you are so nice. I should, I did not have to remind you for the time limit. Thank you. Now, our next panelist is Ali Toki Sheikh. He is a well-known personality in debate on climate change and environment in Pakistan. He was heading lead Pakistan, and he served there for a long time. And he has also leading Pakistan in uh, different government delegations at UNFCCC. Arito Kisha, floor is yours. 
Thank you, sir. And thank you for drawing attention to such an important issue. I just want to highlight uh, one or two points at the beginning. First point I want to make is uh, how to think about NTS or non-traditional threats to security. Four points. One, non-traditional threat to security will need non-traditional responses. The responses to NTS cannot be the same responses as we have for ordinarily traditional, uh, already known traditional threats to our security. So the responses have to be very non-traditional also. Number two, NTS need not be totally domestic or totally interstate. There's an overlap. Many issues that are very domestic um, are also very regional or very international. There are many examples such as emerging climate related non uh, cl climate related transboundary battles include river flows, cloud outbursts as we had in uh, Sialkot and uh, then again in Noshera, cyclones and tsunamis, uh, transboundary air pollution or smog, migration and refugees, droughts and desertification, epidemics and pandemics as we know presently, even the travel restrictions are not determined by uh, uh, these things. So, so it need not be totally domestic or totally international, there's an overlap. NTS need not be zero sum. It's not win or lose. Both sides can be win, win, win if collaborative relationships um, are aspired and common grounds are crafted to work together. NTS can be process oriented. It not, need not be necessarily outcome oriented. It's not a win a war or lose a war. It's a process both or all sides put together, um, design or develop a process. Uh, NTS finally in this regard, need intelligence with small i. Small i means engagement of knowledge economy in the, and diverse stakeholders. It's not a soldier with sophisticated weapons or courage or a discipline. It is indisciplined professors and, and NGOs or civil society or decision makers who need to put their head together as part of workers' of, uh, uh, knowledge economy. Now in recent years, my second point, a lot of domestic um, conflicts that we see are rooted in climate change. A recent example that became very famous was Syrian civil war since 2011, rooted in drought. Mali conflict since 2012. Conflict that's going on in Nigeria since 2009. Then there are more and more local conflicts that are rooted now, now we know and we didn't know for decades, rooted in droughts such as um, Sudan, that war, Somalian civil war. Um, then there are flood oriented conflicts such as it happened in, in uh, monsoon in 2011, uh, Myanmar in 2017. And I want to sum it that Kashmir dispute between India and Pakistan in many, many ways is a water dispute. I believe that a lot of conflict in Afghanistan is because of prolonged, dec uh, decades prolonged droughts in Afghanistan and neighboring Afghanistan coming from arid and semi-arid land that forces people to migrate to the other areas. And conflict in Balochistan is also rooted. Having said that, I wish to conclude by saying that in recent years, there are several resolutions coming from UN Security Council that focus on non-traditional threats. Um, and at, uh, in a very unprecedented way, Lake Chad Basin conflict, for the first time, Security Council member made a field visit. They went there as a delegation to study how deeply rooted it was a water conflict between the stakeholders there. So my submission is, as my colleagues mentioned earlier, that 
many of these issues that we think are straightforward environmental issues and they can be um, hushed under the rug. They are essentially, there's an interface between poverty and climate change. And these two are the twin challenges of the century. Thank you. Thank you, Anita P. Sir. It's to listen to you. And uh, I hope during discussion, we'll also listen to your experience for the city can. So all your different countries are facing this problem. So our next speaker is Dr. Kamar Muhammad Javed Iqbal. He is a well-known uh, scholar on the policy and governance and sustainable development. Currently, he is working with the National Institute of Maritime Affairs. So Kamar will be talking about climate change and our traditional maritime security threat. Kamar, floor is yours. Thank you, Shakil. Uh, nice to see you and hear you after a long time uh, since we worked together and we have very good memories in the past. So uh, maybe the participants, some of them already know it, and uh, but most of the faces they are unaware of. So I told that we have very good, we had very good friendship and good memories uh, and worked together on the subject. Today we are talking so. Today, the global community has consensus that the climate change is the most concerned transnational issue. And it has emerged as an important dimension of peace, national security, and human rights. It has now become a major contemporary challenge of 21st century by posing big risk to the traditional national security worldwide. The cascading effects of climate change are attributed through its convergent evidences and manifestations across all sectoral economies. Over the next 100 years, one third of the current global land cover will be transformed. Hence, the world will be facing increasingly hard choices among consumption, ecosystem services, restoration, preservation, or degradation, and non-traditional security is central to the national security comprising the dynamics and interconnections among humans and natural resources. According to IPCC report 2007, climate change is impacting different non-traditional non security aspects of human life, such as water availability, as of the earlier speaker already highlighted these things, food, health, and uh, ecosystem. It is fact that the poor regions, developing countries, the coastal communities, and ocean-based economy are more vulnerable to non-traditional security threat due to climate change. Pakistan is among the forefront nations whose security is at high risk. And probably we all agree to this. The periodic German watch statements have ranked Pakistan in top 10 vulnerable countries in the world, despite having negligible contribution towards anthropogenic drivers of climate change, that is less than 0.5% of GAG emissions. Pakistan's high vulnerability index is due to a variety of ecosystem from alpine to coastline and poor response mechanism towards climate extreme events, which were more frequently observed in the recent past. In November 2016, we all witnessed that Lahore had a smoke problem. And for that uh, smoke, it had 4,206 microgram per cubic meter particulate matter for PM10, if you talk about which exceeded more than three times from the year 2000's value. So it means there's variation and the change and the things are, you know, the problems are uh, going to manifest further. So ambient air quality standard for PM10 is 150 microgram. So you can compare. In April 2015, there was a freak tornado in Peshawar due to which 35% died and 15, 150 injured. In July 2015, a glacial lake outburst happened in Chitral and a worst heat wave in Karachi, hit Karachi that suffocated urban heat trap and created a death toll of 1300 persons in a week time. So as a result of a freak snowstorm, an avalanche hit Naran mine in October 2015 due to which tourists standard and deaths were also reported. During the whole year 2015, farmers faced the burnt of slow climate change shifting weather patterns and string of crop failures. The devastating flood of 2010 affected the whole country, we all know. In subsequent year, four weeks from August to September 2011, we also witnessed a continuous torrential rail that had created an unprecedented flood in Sindh, including 
the coast, coastal belt of Thatha and adjoining area of Badin. It affected 8.9 million population in Sindh by damaging 6.79 million acres land and 1.5 million homes and a toll of 434 deaths. The Bedeen district received a record-breaking rainfall of 615.3 millimeters during the monsoon spell, exceeding the earlier record of 121 millimeters dating back in 1936. This variation in Bedeen localized weather system, Bedeen's localized weather changed the growing patterns which affected cash crop melon due to germination issues on a very large scale. Huge losses could have been avoided by minimizing the threats to economic, food, social, and life security aspects if a prompt climate adaptation response mechanism was in place. Over all above, it is quite an alarming by knowing that in September 2015, National Institute of Oceanography sent an- Can you one story. minute, please? Yes, I'm just about two minutes, please. Global uh, USCP, uh, Set by uh, uh, where I was. So I was talking about uh, Malir issue that uh, NIO sent an ominous warning to Senate committee regarding Malir underwater. According to NIO report, some parts of Karachi's Malir area have already gone underwater. So this is a quite alarming situation. Ocean heat on the other uh, on the other side. If you talk about there are also uh, changes happening. The if you talk about ocean heat content and acidity, it would have major impact on marine life. And Pakistan's marine fishery is at high risk, thus raising economic, food, and social security concerns. There is no early warning system and no capacity to cope with or adapt to the potential threats to the entire ecosystem. It needs innovative solutions and replication of mariculture technology by fisheries development board etc and the, if you uh, recently there was a move at the level of i'm skipping most of the things but uh, i'm just going to the conclusion part that recently there was a move at the level of uh, relevant stakeholders for the formulation of national climate change action plan for the period of 21 uh, 2021 to 2030 the federal government would be in right direction if it comes true it is a good pattern for a highly vulnerable country and was an awaited step since after the promulgation of Pakistan Climate Change Act 2017. However, the production of an articulated and coherent document would be a major challenge. So it is pertinent that the set of maritime climate actions should adhere the philosophy of climate compatible development by covering the various aspects of vulnerability and adaptation, mitigation, resilience, and low carbon development. A maritime climate task force or a coordination committee of officials from MOCC, MoMA, provincial environment ministries and other stakeholders, including National Institute of Maritime Affairs, civil society okay. organization and think tanks be former, formed at federal level to oversight, observe the or observe the various aspects of environment and climate change and suggest time to time solutions. Last but not least, active engagement and fair participation of our relevant stakeholders need to be ensured in all processes at local, provincial, national, and international level, federal and provincial governments need to ensure full compliance with the implementation of available Pakistan national, Merit uh, national climate change policy 2012 and its implementation framework. In this con context, there is a need to bring more clarity in the federal and provincial jurisdiction, particularly important for climate mitigation. You are exceeding your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kamal. We will come back to you again. So our next speaker is Dr. Sara uh, Amar. She is currently working at the Department of Environmental Sciences, International Islamic University, Islamabad. Ma'am, floor is yours. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Am I audible to all of you? Yes, please go ahead. Thank you very much for inviting me to this important session. Uh, as you all know that I have been associated with the academia for the last 15 years. Uh, therefore, fortunately, I got a chance to sensitize future leaders on the pressing issue of climate change and its impacts. I just need to say only a few words. Uh, well, a lot has been said on the topic 
And uh, as you all know that a lot of jargons have also come up during the last two decades, like climate compatible development, climate smart agriculture, non-traditional security threats, national security paradigms. But I must say that uh, no one denies the fact that climate change is no more a myth, it's a reality. Therefore, time is right for effective and timely actions and responses at each and every level of society. So I conclude myself that uh, uh, we simply cannot afford further delay in implementing whatever the strategies and mechanism we do have in any form in any status. Thank you very much. That was too quick. I was not prepared. So thank you so much for your comment. And uh, now we will be moving towards our next speaker. So we have with us today, uh, Mr. Amina Khurshid Alam. She is a member of uh, the National Assembly. She is a very prominent figure on climate change. She is not only, the, uh, we did not invite her, just only as a parliamentarian. She is working on the issue for many years. She engaged different uh, platform in the uh, National Assembly. She actually be engaged youth uh, parliamentarian forum for the climate change. She engaged a women caucus for the, parliament, uh, for the parliamentarian. She engaged them for climate change. She also served as a parliamentarian secretary of the Ministry Hello. of Climate. So, ma'am, can you hear me? Ma'am, ma Romina, can you hear me? I think there is some problem. Maybe yeah, we'll, uh, 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 I can hear you, but uh, somehow there is a breakage of uh, distortion in the line. Can you hear me, please? Yes, no, we can hear you, ma'am. Yeah. I'll just give you your introduction. And uh, she, uh, Ms. Romina Khushidalam, as I already shared with you, we did not invite uh, her. Can I, should I call back or is it okay? This is okay, perfectly okay. Sorry, hello. hello. Yes, it is okay. Perfectly fine. Hello. Hello. We can hear you. Ma'am, can okay, you hear us? So fine, that's great. Uh, Assalamu alaikum and good afternoon. Good morning. I don't know, uh, uh, like from. Hello. Hello. Yes, there is a man with your voice. Uh, Mr. Shakil, can you hear me, please? Yes, no, I can hear you, but your signals are dropping, ma'am. Okay, fine. Uh, that's uh, really nice of you, It's a great honor, and I'm really grateful to uh, Mr. Shakil and, of course, the Institute, uh, which have uh, given me this opportunity to uh, talk about the climate change. But I believe that climate change is the not only the subject, it's new. Clear, like I believe it's the more bigger uh, issue, which is moreover a big threat towards us, all of us, because you know uh, currently uh, the situation which is happening, which is going on, because as it's something which is related to one country or to me or to someone else, because everyone who is a human being or non-human being, living things or non-living things, we all are suffering. Either we are on the soil, either we are underwater. Uh, The, the the species who are living underwater. So I think it's a big, biggest threat world. So for climate change, if I active, uh, in not only in the policies, because if we talk about the policies, yes, we do have a great policies, but unfortunately, as being a member of a parliament, I think as being a legislature, uh, it is our task to do the legislation. But I think the more biggest thing is to uh, come up with the implementation side. Because unfortunately, most of when we talk about the mitigation and litigation, so I think now it's the time to come up because right now everyone is talking about to plant the trees. Uh, uh, we need to work on the, you know, I, I don't want to uh, criticize on any government or, or any political thing, because I believe the climate change is a subject on which we need to work uh, togetherly with, with, with each other cohesively. We need to work cohesively because 
it is not a subject on which we should do the politics. In fact, it's a subject where we need to be together because this is as much as important as we talk any human right issue. If you talk, it's uh, like, you know, any issue uh, relevant to uh, food security, like the, the way the, everything which is um, important for a human is come, I think it's come under the umbrella of climate change. And the biggest impact, not only in this pandemic, uh, while everyone is saying that it's a great pandemic, but I feel that if we check the temperatures, if we go through with the, uh, the with the pollution rate, I think it get little increased. The way people said that, you know, the sky is clear. The people say they're saying that they now start getting more time, opportunity to see the stars. But anyways, sitting in the parliament as being the member of a parliament, um, we have tried our level best. Uh, we are trying as being an opposition member, but I think on the climate change, we do have a standing committee. Um, Madam Munaza Hassan is the chair. We are trying our level best to talk about more, more about the solutions, more about because as they're talking about to put the trees, to sow the trees, you know, we should go for the plantation. But you know, then the biggest other challenge, um, I'm really um, thankful to Mr. Shakil Ahmed, uh, who has given a few days back while we were having a discussion and it's a very valid point in his research no doubt where you know if we are planting every day trees and trees what about the water from where we're going to get that much water which we are talking because of course when we are going to sow some trees they need water too so you know every uh, time either it's um uh, it's some electricity issues or either it's gas, either it's water, either it's plantation. Unfortunately, we are not talking about the consumption, how much water is required, how are we going to look after them, which plant is better uh, for, the, uh, for which soil. And, you know, somehow just doing anything for the sake of a uh, thing, I think it's not uh, the valid uh, reason. Other than that, I think it's a great... Um, um, role of the civil societies because uh, I always believe that working along with the research organization, with the think tanks, and uh, with the civil society, nothing can be possible because I think uh, it's my personal opinion, which I have not only uh, experienced, I have seen, I have got a very great help from all these um, uh, organizations, especially uh, Mr. Shakil Sahab, SDPI and all. They always um, be being a very kind and great support because without, uh, as being a legislature, yes, we can do the legislation, but I believe uh, the think tanks, the research people, they can can work they can help us as our brain as our ear and eyes because with the help of them with their their research because as being a legislature we don't have that much time you know like for that uh, capacity as well for the research so on that note i think it's very much important as yesterday we were having a uh, paco conference in which uh, there was a very uh, well subject of uh, regarding to climate change so in that there are most probably the countries every country most probably they are suffering with the same issues but somehow they are working on the solutions the pertinent solutions the basic solutions and above now because we Pakistan is currently unfortunately talking about the basic issues in fact other than that if we'll see that there is a few small countries which we feel that maybe they're small but in the solutions they are far 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 better and they're performing and they're doing the best because they believe on the climate issues uh, they all are together uh, with this uh, note, I don't want to take because I want to listen more from all, uh, uh, mashallah, the very uh, knowledgeable people. I'm sure um, they all, all are very, very uh, having a great knowledge. Um, I still believe I'm a toddler in that. I just always love to learn from everyone. Whatever the uh, great suggestions, I would request that please do um, keep me in loop, as, uh, in loop as well so we can, uh, be, we can follow on those things. And uh, along with those suggestions, I would really request um, to uh, Mr. Shakil, uh, along with your help, if we can, uh, you know, come up with the strong suggestions, like no doubt we have uh, talk, uh, talked about the plastic bags, the plastic issues. But, you know, I think now it's a time to talk more about other how we can, you know, utilize the um, water, because I still remember I have given the suggestion the way Pakistani people are wasting water. The most poor areas, they're most uh, wasting the water in the washing cars every morning. If we go in some uh, sort of a places, 
unfortunately every home or every bungalow or um, you know big houses they are having three four cars and the drivers are washing those cars and the water is getting wasted and so many other things so i uh, still remember that when i talked about the water consumption like we should have to have the water meters and especially uh, we should um, you know uh, ask the fine if someone wasting water like in this way but somehow i know the people make lots of noise on that but i think this is the time now because if now we don't speak if we now we don't raise nothing going to happen so i looking forward for the suggestions and whatever i can do in my capacity and other uh, than that my few other fellow um, members who are working um, uh, on climate change subject of the climate change because i don't believe it's a subject i believe it's a need as it's important as we have to take a breath it's very much important to work together and in a right direction uh, on climate change and over that i think on that note i think um, uh, the organizations the civil society the people uh, very much knowledgeable like you guys can help not only help us can uh, take us to the right way thank you very much thank you ma'am rumila khurshid alam and uh, you rightly proposed a uh, yeah, very Areas where we can work and we can work, and I I can assure you the participants whenever we did something and propose something, Ramin always took it to the right floor. Thank you, ma'am. So now we are going to our next uh, speaker. After that, our next speaker is Mr. Monir Ahmed. He is executive director of Devcom. Monir, can you hear me? Monir, can you hear me? I think. Uh, Uh, i can hear you so floor is yours boss uh, thank you very much uh, shikil rame sahab uh, after having uh, listened to uh, so many wonderful uh, speakers and uh, my gurus in like uh, who uh, taught us uh, climate change and environment and everything you know uh, i think like uh, most of, like everything has been said um and uh, like uh, the speakers uh, like me who comes at the tail have um, you know nothing to say much but uh, still i believe like uh, i have uh, a couple of uh, uh, observations that i would like to make and uh, they are um, uh, the um, speakers have already mentioned the non traditional threats that we have as uh, my mentor ali tofi sheikh has mentioned like we need to have a uh, uh, non traditional ways to handle uh, the non traditional threats but unfortunately uh we are talking a lot about it and if you just uh, see uh the research papers that have been published on climate change uh you would see most uh, of uh, the researches uh, done on uh, uh, they have uh, the same sort of uh, uh, content i uh, we don't find any uh, specific uh, uh what we call uh, um dimension a new dimension to it the same uh, monotonous the same uh, sort of content we find in the research so my uh, uh concern is that uh, we need to have more specific researches uh instead of having like a macro approach we need to go for some uh, very uh, micro and uh, micro case studies are uh, focusing on uh, a uh, specific uh, areas and uh, secondly uh, uh rumina khurshid alam was uh, speaking uh, uh, about uh, the parliament's role and we have seen uh, there are, uh, are the two committees national uh, assembly standing committee on uh, uh, climate change and we also have senate uh, standing committee on climate change but over the years we have seen no significant agenda of uh, these two uh a uh, committees uh i uh, executive member like when our friend like uh, who used to be a wonderful colleague at uh, wwf maria morangzeb now uh she is a spokesperson of uh, pmln when she was appointed uh, uh with the uh, speaker's uh, chamber as uh, uh you know focal person for a task force on climate change and we had a meeting and we developed uh, uh, outline of certain uh agenda where a parliamentarians could play a role but since then 
I have seen very meager role of parliamentarians in uh, uh, legislation, specific le legislations. We have uh, much legislation, but uh, we also need, but uh, I, I have seen even uh, uh, a very um, little uh, uh, contribution of, uh, of uh, we, we see like uh, they are not uh, educating their people in their uh, constituencies. Secondly, they are not uh, propagating uh, what is happening in their uh, constituencies. So uh, the, uh, uh, these are a couple of things that uh, I think uh, where parliamentarians can uh, play their role. And uh, secondly, uh, we have seen... Uh, 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 the, uh, 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 you know, whatever the meager funding we get from uh, international donors and under climate, uh, uh, green climate fund, uh, but uh, the fund, the uh, spending of the funding is not very rational. And sometimes we also see overlapping. So, and uh, uh, secondly, I see uh, very reduced um, role of uh, civil society organizations and engagement of uh, community. So like if we really uh, have to uh, go for mainstreaming of uh, climate in uh, 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 Pakistan and we have to reach out to communities, uh, we need to have uh, very uh, proactive approaches. We need to engage uh, uh, specifically uh, parliamentarians into and uh, use uh, best uh, uh, of the resources. Uh, so uh, these are a couple of things that uh, I wanted to mention. And uh, thank you uh, so much, Shkil Rame sahab. Thank you, Mani Rame sahab, Executive Director Devcon, for your uh, suggestions. Now, our uh, next speaker is Dr. Muhammad Aslam Khan, uh, Muhammad Aslam Khan sahab. So he will be talking about water. He has worked on the water for many years. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, let me congratulate you for uh, excellent uh, presentations by all the speakers. Uh, due to shortage of time, I'll just uh, go to two, three slides. And uh, that is, uh, I would request Larai if she is there, to just go on to slide number uh, 9, 10, and 11. If you can share that. No, 9, next. 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 She is next. doing it. Next. Oh, yeah, thank you. Next. Actually, I just wanted to because yeah, just stop here because uh, everybody has spoken about it. Just I wanted to share a few things about the strategy, how we can work on that. The number one is to undertake urgent uh, reforestation and already our reforestation program uh, has been a very success story in KPK. And now again, a uh, lot of uh, countries outside, they have also appreciated that. Uh, building of dams in third to store rainwater devise and implement a waste management strategy for mountainous area, and particularly this uh, banning of diesel vehicles in the mountain because they are the main source of pollution, and particularly the old models, I mean, they can't do straight away, but already government is thinking on that, and to switch to the renewable energy sources. Next. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, then there are certain ways to of the government to confront climate change, that is to protect and restore key ecosystems. Uh, respect for nature is fundamental, support small agriculture producers, promote green energy, combat short-lived climate pollutants. And uh, like you also mentioned, Shakil, that uh, we need to work on adaptation apart from uh, mitigation. And then uh, since, uh, uh, Romania brought out a very good point, and I am also a proponent of that to have the water meters and uh, our NGO, because I had an NGO. Uh, we have a very good success program, which we installed meters. And I can tell you that there has been 
uh, about 15 to 20 percent saving of water into that union councils where we did that. Uh, now, since I'm also working with the youth, so my next uh, message or I would ask the youth to make a pledge with me today is on the next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, and here also I would just like to go on to the right block uh, where I would request all the youth because uh, that is our mainstay, they are our future, that we should pledge today and this should form part of the government policy also to reduce spending by 20%, reduce energy level use by 20%, reduce petroleum product again by 20%, save your earnings by another 20%, reduce, reduce water usage by 20%, and increase energy conservation 20%. Similarly, quality time with your family, spend more time with them, at least increase by 20%. Uh, similarly, uh, you can uh, reduce uh, uh, or increase your volunteer time with the, uh, with the community because the government cannot do everything. We have to be part of that. Like uh, Munir also said, that more the civil society, the more the NGOs gets involved, the better it will be for the country. Then reduce your garbage in terms of weight by 20%, increase the amount of local food by, to buy by 20%, reduce travel miles by 20%. Luckily, yeah, unluckily, because of pandemic, already there has been no traveling. So this is that is why you find uh, many places which were much more polluted because of now less traveling and less air pollutants. that areas are now much better and increase outdoor activities by 20% and reduce busy work by 20% and reduce household clutter by 20% and reduce plastic usage. Government has done very good things on this and particularly in Islamabad. And I can see that uh, there is a certainly uh, decrease in the usage of the plastic. So these are some of my... Uh, suggestions which uh, particularly when I, when I say uh, this, uh, I address to the youth because uh, they are the one who have to create that awareness. And today, if we pledge 20%, even if we can achieve 10%, I think that would be good. Uh, that's all. And uh, wish you the best of luck. Thank you, Brigadier Aslam, sir, for your uh, insightful uh, presentation. Now, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Hassan Abbas. He is an expert on water issues. And we would love to listen from him what he suggests. Dr. Hassan Abbas. Sir, if you can rotate your camera so we can see you in a better shape. Okay. Okay. Laura is yours. Please go ahead. Okay. Let, let, let me just rotate my camera and then we see where we go from there. Yeah, that is better. Please go ahead. That is better. Oh, all right, great. Let me just fix it. And uh, uh, okay, Shkil, thank you very much uh, to CGS and uh, HSF uh, for arranging this uh, session. Uh, I would straight away come to uh, some of the very important. Uh, uh, solution uh, solution oriented uh, things uh, because we have talked about climate change a lot and a lot of things have been said so no need to uh, repeat them over except for one thing uh, that when we say with the state face that uh, uh, we, we kind of play uh, play victims that our contribution to greenhouse gases is very little as a nation uh, but uh, the impact is more we should not at the same time be forgetting that a lot of industrial products that we are using from uh, that, that we are using in our country are coming from the big polluters like China, like uh, Japan, like South Korea. Uh, so uh, actually, if we have developed our own industry, we would be producing a little more greenhouse gases, but we will not be uh, and, and consequently those countries would be producing as less greenhouse gases. So we have to do a little bit more uh, careful accounting about our uh, consumption patterns that how much greenhouse gases go into the industrial products that we import from overseas. So that point must be kept in mind. That was one point. All right. Second 
because my main uh, forte is uh, in the water resources management. So uh, I would like to, uh, uh, I mean, emphasize this point that uh, uh, water is the most impacted uh, element of nature by whatever is this climate change. Because hydrological cycles are driven by the planetary energy. And if we make any change, negative or positive, in the planetary energy, as the climate change is doing right now, it is going to impact our hydrological cycles. And with the impact of hydrological cycles, we are going to have different flow regimes in our uh, natural systems. Now, we have developed a lot of infrastructure in order to modify our natural flow regime. I mean, Indus Basin, which is like uh, other people have mentioned, we are one basin country. Indus Basin is one of the most modified river basin of its size in the world. No other basin has been cut, shut, dammed, divided, and diverted the way Indus Basin has been. And even before the climate change has fully set in, in this part of the world, we are seeing that our uh, infrastructure and, and, the, and the philosophy behind building that infrastructure has not been uh, working for us in a very nice way. Uh, today, our provinces are fighting between themselves for their share of water. Every farmer is fighting with the other farmer for their share of water. I mean, water feuds among the farmers is a routine thing in our so-called agriculture system, the biggest in the world. Uh, and then the, the countries sharing the basin, uh, India and Pakistan in particular, they are not at peace with each other. They are not comfortable talking about water with each other. And they, are, they still think that one is taking the share of the, 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 share of the other's water. So, what we see from this is that our infrastructure and our philosophy behind building that infrastructure, our assumptions behind that infrastructure are not working for us. Yet, today, we are planning billions, I would say tens of billions of investment to enhance the same model into future. I mean, that is a very serious mistake both in terms of climate resilience and both in terms of uh, investment that we are making today in our country. Therefore, my very strong recommendation would be that before focusing single-mindedly single on one particular type of solutions, which are basically the old mindset of damming and diverting the rivers, we should also look at the alternatives. And I tell you, there is not one, but tens of alternatives to managing water in this world, which is so much full of knowledge these days compared to only 50 years ago. We have so many alternatives. We have, have the alternatives from water management. We have alternatives for uh, based in aquifer management. We have alternatives based on uh, nature-based solutions. We have alternate based on flowing river systems rather than dammed river systems. So there are so many alternatives. So the important thing is that those alternatives should be brought in the main course of discussion at every forum where a particular solution for water management, especially those billion dollar solutions are being discussed. There has to be a space for discussing in parallel, the alternatives of the same amount of investment in an alternative, so that we might not miss out on something which we have today, and we just invest on something that we did in the past, which is now outdated. So this is a very important point that I want to bring home. Please bring in the main course of discussion, the alternate solutions, and then there has to be a mechanism to rationalize and, Thank you. Uh, and do the due diligence on those alternate solutions and whatever comes at the top uh, based on science, based on economy, based on social sciences, based on environment, that should be adopted. But Thank just you. forcing one solution is not the right thing to do. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hassan, for presenting. Now I would like to request Mr. Fezanul Hassan, 
He is a director at Paxar Council of Research in Water Resource Management. Mr. Feza, can you listen to me? Yes, Shakil sir. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much, Shakil sir and CGS uh, uh, for uh, giving us an opportunity to talk about on this very important uh, issue. Today, uh, uh, I'm going to uh, pre uh, present a slightly different perspective, uh, uh, which is based on uh, some logic and uh, rationality. As you all uh, well aware that uh, Pakistan has it uh, not only has diverse uh, uh, geography, but uh, it has diverse climate as well. We have uh, uh, high mountains in the north and northwest. We have uh, Indus uh, uh, plain, we have plateau, we have deserts, we have coastal line, and uh, we have uh, uh, diverse climate as well from uh, cold winter to hot summer. And plus uh, we have 75% uh, about 75% rainfall in monsoon season. Uh, and you all know that uh, climate related challenges are not uh, new to Pakistan and the nation has suffered in the form of extreme floods and prolonged droughts for many decades, which supports the philosophy that these challenges are native to Pakistan's arid climate and is based on simple logic, rationality and past historic data. A divergent philosophy is that the, uh, the challenges are due to growing impacts of climate change and is based on numerous scientific studies resulting in a general popularity of belief. Now here, main question which we have to answer is climate change reality happening in country? If yes, how to respond to it? Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, I could not see a single report available both nationally and internationally that can establish Pakistan vulnerability to climate change on the basis of scientific methods uh, of determining climate change recommended by the IPCC. Uh, we uh, all talk about uh, uh, one uh, report which my colleague also referred uh, previously. Uh, the, uh, the German uh, watch report, which uh, basically clim uh, based on climate risk index, uh, which ranks Pakistan among top 20 most vulnerable climate change countries. Uh, uh, what is that index? This index drives the estimation on the basis of dollars, values of infrastructure damage and loss to human life caused by climate related disaster during a period from 1999 to 2018. An interesting factor is uh, uh, in the estimation is the human resource development index and purchase power parity. And you know that, all know that during that uh, period of 20 years, Pakistan was most critical uh, in the world. We are the nation which was fighting proxy war on terror and most of the development budget intended for disaster preparedness was diverted to national security. We have also seen internally displaced people due to terrorism, shrinking job market, and increased burden on international loans. Uh, uh, in uh, uh, that period, we also witnessed uh, uh, two major floods, uh, which is 2010 and 2014, and consequent damage to standing agriculture crops, which highlighted Pakistan vulnerability to climate-related disasters. Now the question arises, what geographically diverse country like Pakistan has to face with respect to the issues attributed to climate change. Balochistan province, which represents 45% of country's landmarks, suffered from rocking drought. Gilgit Baltistan and Azad Jammu Kashmir region faces glove and landslide. Desert areas are experiencing anomalous weather, uh, weather patterns over consecutive years. Heat waves and urban flooding are becoming frequent in large cities. Coastal belt is threatened by unregulated force in the delta and cyclones. The threat from northwestern hill torrents flowing across the provinces is a continuous phenomenon since- so You have one minute season. to conclude, please. So there is a possibility that while pursuing climate change blindly, we may miss much uh, greater uh, issues faced by the nation. Climate variability is a far more complex and disasters, but ignored issues posing new and extensive challenges every year. I conclude uh, uh, my talk uh, uh, 
that uh, what is the uh, solution to begin with there is a need to generate ownership among the people regarding the issues of climate change respective of the vulnerability zone they live in. Uh, 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 I quote uh, a quote from Nobel laureate Bongara Mathi of Kenya once said, you cannot protect the environment unless you empower people. You inform them and you help them. Understand that these resources are their own. They must protect them. In this regard, there is a need to transfer the responsibility of preparedness to the people, which will only come through awareness. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Fezal Hassan. Now at the end, as we have done with our speakers, now at the end, I will run through my presentation and I assure you, I will not take more than five minutes. So the speaker don't feel like that being a moderator, I'm taking more time. So Lareb, if you can run so my presentation. So as I mentioned earlier, so this is the study which we did at the ground level. We collected the data from the community. So what they are talking about different issues, I just want to show you. I will not elaborate on it because there is no time for the elaboration. So Lareb is just uh, trying to show the presentation. Let's go. Yes, next one. Next one. Next one. This is the thing when we talk to the people, what you think about the climate change. So 86.7% of people said it is impacting Pakistan. Next one. So which are the most vulnerable areas according to the people? It is not from the one district or it is from the one province. It is from the four province of the Pakistan. Look at that. Water, food, and agriculture. These are the key areas people consider. That's me. For people, these are the areas which government should need to focus. Next one. So which would be the most prevalent impact? Because this study was done in the 2014-15. At that time, we were going through a series of floods. That's why the flood was on top of mind of everybody. But drought is also the same. Drought is also the problem for the Pakistan. Next one. So do you think climate change has impacted livelihood of people? This is very interesting questions, answers of the people. Most of the time we say create awareness, people don't know. But these are the community people to whom we never consulted. I think they don't know about the climate change. This is their reaction. Next one. So conflict on resource. Because resource, conflict on resource will be the key for the conflict and the cause of the national security. Because when people will be fighting over the resources, it will lead to the civil strife, which can create problem for the national security. Next one. Next one. Oh, sorry, previous one. So this is, do you think climate change will pose threat to national security? Again, people are seeing. This is the primary data. Again, I'm focusing. This is not the expert interviews or the theoretical framework. These are the interviews of the common people. Next one, please. Next one. Yes, this is my last slide. So, what would be the priority list for the Pakistan? As Speaker Allah has spoken, number one, Pakistan needs vulnerability index. We need our own vulnerability index so we can decide accordingly. Then the policy input. Then a study on climate change and national security. I will. So these are the few findings that are in the priority list. But I want to add one thing here. In the recent years, so sea and the maritime has emerged one of the key areas of our interventions. People are talking about the blue economy, but let's talk about climate change and its impact on its impact on uh, uh, sea. What is the how climate change will impact the sea? Or we have to go for the sustainable blue economy. In this context, the study on the maritime has become extremely important. That should also be included in the priority list. Thank you so much. These are the few slides. If anybody has interest, I can share the study with you people. So, so with this, I think we are done with. So we have one more speaker with us. He has joined us just Dr. Muhammad Khan. He is a professor with National Defense University. Professor Muhammad Khan, the floor is yours. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Mr. Shakil, 
thank you very much and thank you very much cgss i think uh, uh, you have not obs uh, observed i have been uh, in the meeting right from the beginning uh, before uh, you we could listen to you i was here and uh, i thought that uh, i will be making a presentation but ultimately i had to ask the administration uh, that uh, you are either deliberately or otherwise ignoring me this is very upsetting <clears throat> sir when we invite guests we don't ignore them unfortunately you are dis from the list you disappeared there was disconnection for the internet so we could not see was, you no there was no it. disconnection there was no disconnection for your Sorry, correction for please there was never a disconnection as far well as i am concerned there is sorry for inconvenience but our intention is never like like that thank you okay ladies and gentlemen i think uh, the gentleman has already concluded the meeting uh, i just uh, wanted to say uh, as a few words about uh, first of all the non traditional security uh, threats and the challenges uh, we generally face and in that i would say that uh, non traditional threats they transcend the national boundaries and they are transnational in character uh, go beyond the military spheres and most of the time they have the sudden and unexpected appearance and uh, the biggest target of this non traditional security threats are the challenges it is the human security uh, i would just quote that uh, in south asia only over 35% population it suffers from the abject poverty and this abject poverty is emanating from the non traditional security challenges human security i would say that uh, it is much endangered and that in south asia there perished more than 160000 people due to natural disasters since the beginning of this new millennium and this is more than what uh, uh, these uh, two countries of the region has faced uh, ever since there have been the clashes between pakistan and india and elsewhere also as far as the climate is uh, concerned the climate change is a key issue confronting the humanity today in addition to the raising at uh, the specter of the looming uh, uh, looming ecological disaster it is also the fundamental human development issue of our time the impact of the climate change will be transferred to human communities in lopsided proportions with the maximum cost transfer to the poorest and the most vulnerable evidently then fighting poverty and the fighting impacts of the climate change have a strategic linkage which needs to be explored for effective policy making the climate change and the human developments are locked in dialectic i mean one is affecting the other thus uh, there are many uh, climate change has many adverse effect and these adverse effects they are felt everywhere and pakistan is indeed a country uh, which is a developing country but affected more uh, not because of its own uh, issues but more than that what the global climate change has impacted this region and i would say that uh, as far as the uh, this uh, effects are concerned the major countries particularly united states china india in this part of the world they are contributing a lot as far as the climate change is concerned which is affecting pakistan also the global climate change regime overseen by the united nations framework convention on the climate change is a complex governance mechanism with the responsibility to coordinate climate change actions among the states the global solution to the dangers of climate change has crystallized in the form of two competing strategies uh, one is indeed the mitigation and another is adoption with the former aimed at the causes and the later addressing the effects of the climate change since the developed uh, countries or the developed world for that matter <clears throat> have a disproportionately uh, large carbon carbon footprint mitigation would not succeed without a cooperative framework involving commitments from all advanced and industrial industrialized countries Uh, since uh, uh, i would say that uh, um, uh, this conference of the webinar is already toward its conclusion i uh, specially concentrate toward uh, the some aspects of the climate change and those are with concern to the water resources which have impacted several economic sectors affected areas their agriculture forestry energy and the provision of drinking water 
and this is so as far as the pakistan is concerned because pakistan is a water scarce country and uh, it is uh, realized at the global level that by 2020 25 uh, pakistan will really uh, feeling this uh, water shortages as far as the drinking water the fresh water is concerned and then water land uh, wetland and the ecosystem they are already being threatened affecting the sectors that depend on the good services uh, which are provided then scientific research has been conducted to explore how water resources might respond to the global change focus predominantly on surface uh, water system uh, the global change may include the natural and anthropogenic influences on territorial climate change and the hydrological cycle which has already been discussed okay uh, i will be concluding by saying that there is a relationship between water energy water energy agriculture and climate and this is the most important uh, relation which generally we talk that what security we are facing as far as the climatic uh, change is indeed affecting the countries like pakistan so as a way forward i would say that let's preserve the water resources and do not disturb natural uh, cycle and the natural climate to the artificial means then create a public awareness improve water management through good governance and water preservation through construction of the dam reservoirs and stop water contamination which is very frequent and indeed ongoing in the pakistan the sooner we realize rapidly disappearing and depleting water sources better it is for the future of the pakistan and the future of pakistan future pakistan generation thank you very much ladies and gentlemen thank you dr mohammad khan saab for adhering to the time no another speaker have joined us what is dr asman jamshed sir floor is yours dr asman jamshed can you hear me assalam alaikum sir thank you very yes, much sir. i am dr asman jamshed from soil and environmental sciences university of agriculture multan uh, thank you for providing this opportunity i really learn a lot from today's session the good thing is that we all are serious and ready to face the climate change i am audible yes we can hear you yes this good thing is that yes the good thing is that we are all serious and ready to face the climate change and we have to work inclusively particularly we have to include more youth in our action groups at our campus at manas university of agriculture multan we have different club societies like tree for plant for life societies clean and volunteer force and other different clubs which are promoting awareness about how we can individually make efforts to mitigate the climate change or help to mitigate the climate change we are open to work with all partners and we are always ready to welcome you all we have some motivated students group of students which can work in community in society and can give their blood thank you very much sir